do have some of these live events happening right now, including uh, there in Pennsylvania, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance sitting down with the Moms for Liberty, talking about these election issues. He just got there. Let's watch. Okay. <laughs> the first hour, we had all of these moms were sharing stories, personal experiences that they've dealt with in the last four years, and then they have some questions that they would like to ask you. Um, but we have a couple that we want to ask you yes, first. Um, right. So you were announced as the vice president pick exactly three months ago today. I'm oh, I, I didn't even realize that. You're right, exactly <laughs> today. It felt like three years ago. <laughs> It does seem like that because we were there. <laughs> but in a so political I, campaign, the days are short, but the weeks are really long. So oh, sure. yeah. it, it, it's like it's like Marine Corps boot camp. You're going so fast, you don't realize that it's passing you by, and then you wake up, and here we are. So what are the major differences that have happened in the last three months since being announced as an Yeah, what has that been like, huh? <laughs> well... There's so much I could talk about, but of course, first of all, we're, we're proud of these guys and we're very grateful to them, but having a Secret Service detail is really weird. <laughs> and, um, you know, I haven't driven a car in three months, which my wife is probably happy about because I have a bit, of, a bit of a lead foot. And I think all the moms on the roads out there are probably happy that J.D. Vance has not been on the road the last few months. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so unusual because if you think about it, you show up to the grocery store and there are like 15 guys surrounding you with the little things in their ear. So even if somebody has no idea who you are, they start to wonder, well, so somebody has to be here because all these secret service agents <laughs> are bouncing around. So there's like, no, there's no anonymity anymore. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that just comes along with the territory. But look, we're having a really good time. I mean, what's, what's different about, you know, running for the Senate than running for vice president. I've only, you know, I ran for the Senate for the first time a couple of years ago is, I, you know, I joke that when I was running for the Senate, you ride around the back of a used Subaru that was owned by one of my staff members, <laughs> and now I ride around a 737, right? So it's like a, it's a little more comfortable than it was, but it's also what's really cool, and, and this is partially just because, you know, life happens, and we had our third baby about four months before the Republican primary when I was running for Senate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this time the kids, they're two, they're four, they're seven, and they can kind of come with us, and they're part of the journey a little bit. And so that's just like a, it's a really cool thing to see the country um, from the perspective of a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. Yeah. And it's just been a very, it's been a very, very nice thing. It's been a great family adventure for all of us. So I really yeah. liked the story. We were together on the, the Tucker tour um, that you were doc talking about how you may have had to cancel on Tucker oh, because Lord. you got sick. I, yeah, that was, <laughs> You didn't die of any, any carnivals t before you came here, right? Uh, no, not no. today. No, <laughs> but that was, that, was a, that was a tough day. So that was in Hershey, PA. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not too far from Hershey, right? No, no. So, so yeah, I, I um, you know, again, because you're surrounded by Secret Service and everybody knows who I am now. And so whenever I do something, there are like 10 separate iPhone cameras that are trained on me, right? And my kid, my seven-year-old, I'm like, all right, I really want you to go on a roller coaster with me at Hershey Park. And he goes, okay, but you have to go on one of these ridiculous spinny rides afterwards. And I do the roller coaster, it's great. And then we get on the spinny ride. And I just, about two seconds in, I think to myself, I'm gonna throw up all over myself. <laughs> and it, it, it was like going so fast, that it, and, I, and I could see these iPhone cameras from people in the, you know, outside of the, the, the ride. I'm thinking to myself, this is gonna look, when I throw up, it's gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna look like one of these old sprinklers, you know? Chook, 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 chook. And it's gonna be captured on camera for the entire internet to see. And luckily, I held together. I think the Secret Service may have actually stopped the ride a few seconds early because they could see that I was really not doing well. But, you know, whatever, whatever revenge my, my son, had he ever wanted to get revenge on me, he got it, that two-minute spinny ride. But look, uh, but, it, but it goes to show, I mean, yeah, okay, that was a very miserable two-minute spin ride. But my son, you know, where, where else do you get to go right. to all these different theme parks and right. see all these different parts of the country? And it's just a very, what a very great cool opportunity thing. to have your children really with you. It really is. And they, again, you, you just you see it through their eyes, and they make little observations, right? Or like you know, we're in Traverse City, Michigan, and my you know they're really into the cherries that we bring home from Traverse City, <laughs> Michigan. Or we go to Hershey Park, and they're really into you know like they have all these Reese themed treats at Hershey. It's it, it just kids notice stuff that I think you don't notice if you're just a 40 year old guy. Right. And I think that noticing has been a really fun part of this. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, and fun. your wife must be just 
Wow. I mean, she's super, <laughs> she's super mama. How is she, she really handling is. it? She really is. I mean, you know, my wife is just this, this amazing person. And she, she quit her job when Trump asked me to become his running mate. Uh, but she's, you know, a, a very brilliant, very accomplished corporate litigator. And she's like, look, if we're going to do this, then I'm going to make this as easy on the kids as possible. And I'm going to come around and travel with you as much as possible, right? Like, like, if we're going to do this, let's make it a family adventure. Uh, I, I will tell you a story. Um, you know, one, one of the first times that the president actually met my wife, the first times they had really talked in any great detail, you know, we, we were actually throwing a fundraiser for him. And the president sort of greets Usha and gives her a big hug. Oh, you're so beautiful. I'm so glad to see you. And he's, you know, th those of us who know him know he's a very engaging guy, uh, despite what the media tells you about him. He's actually just a very warm and normal person. And he asks her what she thinks about me being involved in politics. And she gives, if anybody knows my wife, it's like the perfect Usha answer. It's a very diplomatic answer. And she's like, well, sir, you know, my, son, my, my husband really loves public service. We love the state of Ohio. And I'm just really thrilled to be able to help him out where I can. And Trump looks at her and goes, yeah, my wife hates it too. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm so glad you brought up President Trump. Honesty. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, but that's what I love about Trump. Like, Trump finds the real truth yeah. in something, uh -huh. and whether you want him honest. to say it or not, he just he just points his finger right at it. So I'm glad you brought him up, because a, a lot of people have brought up the fact that you are not a big fan of President Trump. Sure. And Trust that you are very me. vocal he very well. about it. So, uh, every, you know, <laughs> the big thing I think that moms would like to know is, um, what changed? Yeah, well, a lot changed. I mean, one, so one, I become a father, right? So my first was born in 2017, and then our second a couple years later, our third a couple years after that. And I think you think about the country a little bit differently, I think, as at least I did when I became a father. I, start, I took a slightly different perspective, maybe a little bit more protective, a little bit more worried about the future than I had been, even though life was going very well for us. I just think that, you know, sure. being, becoming a dad changes your perspective like that. But I think really importantly is, there were a lot of predictions that were made about Donald Trump's four years in office. And I think for, for swing voters, people are on the fence. There are a lot of predictions right now being made about Donald Trump. If he gets in office, all of these bad things will happen, right? That's what the media says. That's what the Democrats say. And a, a part of me, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but it's, it's, it's more important to be honest, I think, is I, I kind of bought into some of the lies in 2016. Well, and then he was president, and take-home pay was going up faster than it had in 40 years. Inflation was low, the border was secure, and remember they all said Donald Trump was going to start World War III, and yet we had more peace around the globe than we had had in a generation in this country. And you sort of like, okay. And, and I, I, I really, you know, politics is sort of, I, I think the, the incentives are all messed up in politics because, you know, people don't want to admit that they changed their mind. They don't want to admit that they're wrong. And so there's this thing where you try to pretend, even though it's obvious that you screwed something up, you never want to admit it. I think it's actually, it'd be much better if we had political leaders say, you know what? I thought this was going to happen. Something else actually happened. I was wrong. Like, it's okay to be humble and say, I screwed something up. And I, 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 I again, for, for a lot of voters who are still on the fence, I'd say the very same thing they, they're saying about Trump now, they said in 2015 and 2016. Right. Right. And I actually think that we're going to have an even bigger and even better presidential term because we've got, frankly, so many more big problems to solve now than we did even in 2016. So look, basically, he did a hell of a job, and it's important to say I was wrong. Yeah, I think we I do too. Right. That's I want to be able to get to our moms. They have a lot of questions, and every one of their questions uh, relates to this pers personal experience sure. that they had. So, Debbie, if you want to get us started sure. on that. So, Senator, so they all shared uh, very moving stories that have personally affected them, and now they have a question for you Great. regarding that. And I wish I could have seen them. I'm sorry I'm a little late here, it's okay. but it's the nature <laughs> of, a, of a presidential campaign. Is <laughs> yeah. You don't always control your schedule perfectly, but thank you. Yes. Okay. So, the first one I have here is we have Donica Hudson. She's from North Carolina, so she has a question for you. Okay, Senator Vance. Um, my family and I were trapped for five days living the nightmare of Hurricane Helene. Oh, wow, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Appreciate it. FEMA was nowhere to be found the first mm -hmm. week and has done almost nothing. So my question is, what will the Trump-Vance administration do to restructure FEMA and to rebuild Western North Carolina? 
Yes, ma'am. First of all, I'm, I'm sorry that it happened, and I'm sorry, most importantly, that your government didn't do its job in response to it. Because um, what, what, what part of, I guess, so I guess you're part, from the western part of North Carolina? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that if, if you grew up in the Appalachian part of our country, whether in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio, anywhere else, is you often feel like your government doesn't care about you. And unfortunately, after the hurricane, I think that region of the world was really neglected and really left behind by the people who should have been done the most to look out for these innocent victims. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say it, but I actually think that there would, be a, there would have been less loss of life if the government had responded more quickly. And uh, what, what do we need to do to restructure FEMA? I actually think this one is pretty straightforward. You've just got to fire the present leadership and tell FEMA to focus on American citizens and not the illegal migrant issue. The, but, 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 I, but I think there's a second part of this, and it goes to the rebuilding effort. And first of all, I, I promise, I look you in the eye and I promise you that if we win, and I think we're going to win, by the way, I think we're going to win Pennsylvania, we're going to win the whole country. But, I promise you, I'll never forget where I came from, and I'll never forget that we have a responsibility to help you all rebuild. And I'd love to learn a little bit more about your story, though I understand I'm not going to get the full, full picture up here. But the, the other thing is, when you have a crisis like this, there are some things that FEMA is just not equipped for. And so I, you know, I criticize FEMA for focusing too much on the illegal immigrant problem, not enough on American citizens. But let's be honest. This was really a Biden and Kamala Harris shortcoming when as soon as, as the rivers started to swell like they did, the 82nd of Airborne should have been in Western North Carolina the next minute. That is what, should have, that is what really screwed up. And if you think about all the bureaucracy of the federal government, right, you've got eight different agencies that are supposed to do eight different things. You need somebody who is in control, whose only job is to save as many lives as possible. And the fact that it took us six, seven days before that was really possible or that was happening in North Carolina, I hate to say it, I think that there was a lot of loss of life that wouldn't have otherwise happened and just a lot of human suffering that we've got to do a better job of preventing next time. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Madeline uh, Brame. She is from New York, and she has a specific question for you regarding um, her son. Um, hello. Uh, yes, ma'am. Vice President J.D. Vance. Knock on wood. <laughs> She's claiming it. That's good. <laughs> you, you actually heard my story at the RNC. I spoke about of my course. son. Of okay. course. Of course. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, what I want to know, what my question is, is what will a Tr uh, Trump Vance administration do to strengthen and protect the rights for families of homicide victims legislatively? Yes, ma'am. Well, first of all, again, I'm sorry that your government failed you. And I promise you that when we're in office, we're going we're gonna to try to make sure that your government doesn't fail the next person who's dealing with what you're dealing with. And I, 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 here's, the, here's the basic issue. The, the progressives, and I don't think this is true of most Democrats, by the way, but the leadership of the Democratic Party has gotten in their mind that law enforcement is inherently racist. Mm. And I think that's a real disgrace. It's led us to, frankly, dismiss a lot of good cops. And it's meant that we're, we don't empower people to go after the truly bad guys. And, and, and what, I, what I find about so crazy about all this is if you look at the statistics, ma'am, it is a very, very small number of people who commit the gross majority of the violent crime in our communities, right? This is, this is not the gross majority of our citizens, whether they're white, black, or, or whatever, are law-abiding people. There is a very narrow slice of our country that commits chronic violent crime. And the thing that we have to do is change the laws, but most importantly, empower law enforcement to go after the bad guys, lock them up, so they're not hurting more kids like yours. That, it's, that, that, that is fundamentally what you have to do. And what, what I think is so, I just can't believe that one half of our political leadership has gotten in their head that if you lock up criminals, that's somehow a bad thing. Locking up violent criminals is one of the core functions of government, right? And, and you don't have to lock that many people up. Just lock up the violent criminals. 
And we could do we could do so much better. And and and, and part of this is legislative too. And I've sponsored legislation to this effect. Is we got into, we're getting to a point where we've got a major law enforcement crisis in our country. We've got a lot of great police officers that aren't re-upping. You've got a lot of great young men and women who don't want to become police officers because they think it's too hard of a job. We are going to have to really fix the pay and benefits for our local law enforcement so that they get the pay they deserve, but most importantly, so that we get the right people serving as police officers. Because if you think it's, it's bad now, and unfortunately the crime rates are not in a good place right now, it's going to be a lot worse in five years if we don't get better people in, coming into law enforcement, because you've got a lot of very good people who are getting out of law enforcement right now. Right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. So we have an online question. This one is from Gabriella Mason from California. Families are struggling to pay their bills, afford groceries, let alone save for their future. In the last four years, food prices have risen nearly 26%. When is my dollar going to be a dollar again, and how fast can we get back to a 2019 normalcy? <laughs> there you go. How, you got to help us out here. Well, um, <laughs> the, the best thing we can do to lower prices is to elect Donald J. Trump president of the United States. That is the first and most important thing we got to do. And then... And then, I'll, and then I'll talk a little bit about what comes after. But I got to tell you this story. So um, we were actually in Reading, Pennsylvania for this. We were at a, a small Latino grocery store. The, the owners had just bought that grocery store a couple years prior. And my boys were with me, our, my, my seven-year-old boy and my four-year-old boy. And they just wanted to come with daddy on the campaign trail. And we were having a good time out there. And um, I, I'm standing, you know, it illustrates how different kids are. Because uh -huh. I tell the two of them, you can get anything you want. And the four-year-old is trying to get like a gallon of ice cream, right? He's, he's like me. And the seven-year-old, who's like his mama, is trying to get me to buy like a dozen or two dozen eggs. And, he's, and, and I'm like, son, I meant like a candy. Like, go buy some chocolate. And he's like, no, no, dad, you made the last three eggs this morning. If you don't get more eggs, mommy's going to be really mad. It's like, okay, buddy, thanks, thanks for looking out. Very practical. But I, I you know, at, there were, of course, cameras falling around because there always are. And so I, I grabbed some eggs. And I pointed out that eggs have gotten way more expensive under Kamala Harris's leadership. And in, in fact, in the, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, eggs are about 3.20 a dozen from 150 a dozen. That's a huge price increase in just three and a half years. And I unfortunately fear it's going to get worse if, if we promote her to president. But I, I was kind of joking with my kids. I said, "Yeah, this is really important to my family because my kids, you know, these guys eat about 14 eggs a day." Obviously exaggerating, right? Making a joke about my kids who do eat like, you know, who do eat a lot. So I had some like journalist fact check me and say, <laughs> there, there's, there's no way that a seven-year-old and a four-year-old could eat 14 eggs a day. Yeah. And, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm like, it, it would be like me saying, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. And then the journalist being like, JD, in fact, ate a normal man-sized meal, not a horse, right? <laughs> and you, you realize like the media sometimes in this country is so obsessed with d misleading us yeah. that they don't actually report, I mean, some of these real stories of people who are suffering. But I, I, I think the most important thing to answer um, the, the, the questioner's question is a lot of us don't fully appreciate how energy prices go into everything else. And so think about it. If you're you know, a construction worker and you're building a house, but the truck driver who's delivering the lumber to the job site is paying 50% more for diesel, then that house is getting sure. more expensive, right? Yeah. And if you're a grocery store and the truck driver who delivers the groceries or the farmers who are producing the food are paying 50% more for energy, then that's going to make all our groceries go up. So the most important thing that we can do, Donald Trump always says this, drill, baby, drill. Lower the costs of energy, and that's the most important thing that we can do to, to lower the cost of food. And then the second thing to make life more affordable is, look, the government has got to stop spending trillions upon trillions of dollars that it doesn't have. When you do that, you increase the price of everything. Because think about it, when you're printing all this money to cover the government's debts, then all the dollars that are in our pockets become more and more worthless over time. And so, I hate to say it, Kamala Harris cast the deciding vote in trillions of dollars of new spending. We gotta get her out of there and put somebody with common economic sense back in the White House. <laughs> And you see this all the time when you're in the grocery store. Everyone is commenting how expensive everything is, isn't it? Yeah. Are you over there by the eggs, by the cheese, by the milk? And everybody's like, I can't believe this has gotten so expensive. That's Nobody crazy. knows like a mama. Yeah. That's, that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. For us but to balance our checkbooks and, and just uh, yeah. afford it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I actually, in, in our family, probably unlike most families, I tend to do more of the grocery shopping, at least until three months ago. <laughs> Something changed three months ago. 
Um, and I, I, I was just, it's shocking how much some of these, how much more expensive these things are. I mean, to, like to get a steak at a grocery store compared to three and a half years ago, it is just so much more money. I don't know how any middle class person can afford in Kamala Harris's economy to live a good life. We've got to get back to basic common sense here. Yeah, yeah, 100%. We have another question. Yes, we have Taryn and her daughter Penny. Taryn's going to share a question for you, Senator. I'm going to follow suit and um, Vice President J.D. Vance. <laughs> I'm superstitious. You guys are making me nervous here, right? <laughs> Um, my story here today, the, um, the public school in our district socially transitioned my daughter. And um, so my question for you is, there is actually currently a lawsuit against the Conejo Valley Unified School District in Ventura County, California, where three of my other minor children still attend. The district is being sued per, for providing minors with inappropriate gender-affirming surveys and curriculum without the necessary parental notification. With President Trump recently mentioning abolishing the Department of Education, what specific actions will your administration take to uphold my 14th Amendment right to direct the upbringing, care, and education of my children? Wow. Um, I'm so sorry this has happened to both of you. I can't believe that your own leadership has failed in this way, and I promise that when Donald Trump and I are back in office, you're gonna have somebody who fights for you and fights for your right as parents. We want parents making these decisions, yes. not anybody else. Yes. And <laughs> oh, I, I, just, I find with each of you, I, I wanna know so much more about your stories than I know and, and so much more than, than we have time for, of course, but I, I, I just think to take something that is so profound away from our moms and dads is such a violation of every right that exists. So the reason why we establish government is to protect our rights, not to destroy our rights. And it's such a big difference between the Democrats and the Republicans in this race. And, and ma'am, you mentioned education policy. I want to get into that. But let's be honest about something. One of the reasons why we have um, this incredible pressure, I mean, look, being a 14-year-old kid, being a 12-year-old kid, we know it's hard, right? Kids, kids have all kinds of, of tough things going on when they're teenagers, when they're pre-teenagers. And I think, unfortunately, in the era of social media, sometimes we take normal adolescent insecurities and we tell, especially our young girls, well, that's not an insecurity. That's because something's wrong with you. And remember, we used to live in a country that recognized, no, 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 that, that, that there's nothing wrong with you. We just have to teach people how to be comfortable with themselves and to be comfortable with who they are. And the fact that we've gotten away from that, I think is really profound and it's very damaging. But we ask ourselves, why have we gotten away from it? And I think we have to ask ourselves, who's getting rich from what we're pushing down the throats of parents and children? And the answer is, there is a billion dollar industry in cross-sex hormones, in gender transition. And I think that we have to go to the heart of the money and stop telling these pharmaceutical companies that they can make money by experimenting off of our children. It has to stop. And it will stop when Donald Trump is president. Mm -hmm. You actually answered the next question we were oh, going to okay. do online. Sorry, okay. So we won't, we won't do that online <laughs> but, question. Right. Sure. We're going okay. to jump to... But, 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 on, but just on education yep. policy, ma'am, I, I want to say that we don't even realize how much of our tax dollars, how much money of the people in this room goes into funding very radical curriculum. And we ask, right. how, has the, how have the schools gotten away from teaching reading, writing, arithmetic and towards the more you know, cr crazy stuff that we're seeing the schools teach? And the answer is, I'll, often we're paying for it. And what President Trump and I are gonna do is make sure our tax dollars go to educating our children and not to indoctrinating them. Stop the flow of money, and that's how you stop this craziness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We're over here to Vanessa. Yeah. Vanessa is in Florida. Senator, my family and I migrated to the U.S. legally. God bless you. Thank you. From Peru. It was a very daunting, complex process. It took us seven years to make it into the country. Um, how can we make the process easier for those who want to follow the law and come into the country legally? Yes, ma'am. And, you know, one, one of the things I hear from, actually, I was in Tucson, Arizona a couple days ago, 
And I was talking about how part of the problem with our illegal immigration system, and there, there are a lot of problems, but one of them is that it's so profoundly unfair to people who have done the, the right way, who have waited in line, who have paid the fees. And this is one of the reasons why we have to get our hands wrapped around this illegal immigration problem. It's unfair because there are great people who want to come to our country. And I think to, to, to me, the question that we have to ask is, what, what, what is it that we want out of welcoming newcomers into our country? You know, we want people with great values. We want people who are willing to work hard, who are willing to play by the rules, who are going to contribute to their communities. And obviously, you can't let everybody in that wants to come, but you've got to have an orderly process. And I think that part of what we've seen is we've redirected so many resources away from processing legal immigrants who are doing it the right way to focus on illegal immigration that's been facilitated by Kamala Harris, that it's probably harder to come in legally now than it was even 15 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we ought, to we ought to devote the resources that are for processing legal immigrants to legal immigrants and not to this completely broken system that we have under Kamala Harris. So it's border security first, to make sure we secure that southern border, and then I think we, we actually free up a lot of resources to focus on the legal immigration issue in our country. Thank you. Stephanie Turner has a, a question for you too. Stephanie is from Texas. Hello. Hi, Senator Vance. Um, as a mother who has lost a son to fentanyl poisoning, I deeply understand the border crisis and the human impact that it is having. Um, my question to you is, how do we cut through the red tape and move faster to reach every child across the U.S. with education-based prevention programs? We can't afford to sit idle while more lives are lost to innocent children who have no knowledge of this. Yes, ma'am. And uh, how, how old was your, your son? He was 19, he was 19 in 2021. 2021. Mm -hmm. I'm very sorry to hear it. What was his name? Tucker. Okay. I'll say, I'll say a prayer for him tonight. Thank you. And, um, you know, uh, not nearly in the way that you do, but we've, of course, experienced the problems of addiction in my own family. And you know, one of the ways that I think about this is we want people to have second chances because... You know, when, 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 you, when you're caught in the throes of addiction, it's so hard to get out of it, but a lot of people do get out of it. But if they get out of it and then they relapse, and they relapse into fentanyl, sometimes there's not another second chance. And that's really what we have to change. That's why this poison is so dangerous and so deadly, is it takes away those second chances from our families, from our moms, from our dads, from our kids. It's got to stop. And it's, it's disgraceful that we frankly have a government right now that's facilitating it instead of stopping it. And you talked about cutting through the red tape and, and, and you know, what we can do on prevention and education. I think one of these things is you, know, you can only do so much with so many dollars. And so let's say you have curriculum money that's going into radical gender ideas instead of teaching kids how to say no to drugs, how to resist peer pressure, the warning signs for addiction. Because looks, I mean, you, you probably appreciate this, ma'am, having seen it, but, you know, some people get addicted the minute they take an opioid. And some people could take per Percocet for three years and never get addicted. I mean, I, you know, I, I've seen this even with my own friends who had a minor surgery who take one Percocet and they're like, I've never taken it again because I liked it way too much. It did something to me. We got to teach kids to recognize, right, when they're going down that, that very dark pathway. You know, the second thing is, and I, I, know, I know friends from back home, family from back home who were involved in, in detox. And if you think about recovery as being a very long road, the very first step is very often detox. And there are not enough detox facilities in the United States of America right now. We should empower our churches and our local community organizations to provide those detoxes because you can't get into recovery if you don't do the detox first. And it's very, very hard to take that first step. So why don't we make it easier to take that first step in the first place, shut down the poison coming into our country in the first place, and teach our children the red flags and the warning signs about addiction. I think if we do that, we'll, we'll start getting down the road to solving this. I mean, look, I, I, it is an unspeakable human tragedy what's going on in this country. 100,000 people, many of them in the prime of their lives. I mean, I... I, I I, I've known so many people who have lost their lives to this, and I'm sure, ma'am, you, you're asking yourself the same questions like, you know, who, who would he have fallen in love with, right? What, 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 what would his kids have looked like? 
the human tragedy that we're allowing to happen to this country, it has got to stop. President Trump and I will fight to stop it, I promise you. Senator, we have two moms uh, from Pennsylvania. Those are our last Hello. two questions on the stage here. If we have time, we'll go to the online questions with Kimberly. But we have Stephanie Carr from Pennsylvania. Caitlin Carr. <laughs> Caitlin. 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 Caitlin Carr, not Caitlin. Stephanie. Okay. Sorry, Caitlin. There's a lot of people. Um, first of all, Senator, I just want to say thank you for you and your family for the sacrifice you're making to make America, America great again. I, I appreciate it, and so does my family. Um, as an OBGYN nurse, my coworkers and I are experiencing an overwhelming number of illegal immigrant pregnant mothers seeking and receiving free care. Between the volume of patients and the language barrier, insured Americans are not getting the quality care they pay for and deserve. How would a Trump Vance presidency address this escalating problem? Wow. Well, first of all, not that this is necessarily the most important issue today, but I think it was a very important issue a few years ago is maybe our nurses would be less overwhelmed if we didn't have a federal government that was firing people for not taking the COVID shot a few years ago. <laughs> and whatever your views, whatever your views, I think it was smart to let individual nurses and moms and dads make these decisions, not try to force a one size fits all approach from the federal government. And, and ma'am, un unfortunately, the answer to your question is, if you've got 25 million, 20 million, whatever the number is of illegal aliens in your country, we're a compassionate people. We're not gonna let people just expire on the streets, nor should we. So the compassionate thing for our own citizens, but I also believe for illegal aliens too, is to stop the open border and stop people coming into this country in the first place. There's no way to solve the problem without re-implementing some, some strong border policies. And, you know, if, if you look at the state of Pennsylvania, I believe the last time that I checked, but, you know, I'm sure the, the, the media fact checkers will double check my information here, but <laughs> the average hospital emergency room wait time in the state of Pennsylvania is around three hours, right? So you go to the emergency room and you're not getting the care that you need because we just diverted so many resources from caring for people who ought to be here to focus on people who have no right to be here. We have to recognize that there are sometimes trade-offs and the compassionate thing is not to open your border and allow Mexican drug cartels to sex traffic little kids into our communities. The compassionate thing for our own citizens and I think for everybody else is to secure the border and focus on some basic common sense law enforcement. That's what we have to do. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. We have another question from Pennsylvania. Yeah, Angelina. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm superstitious too, so Senator Vance. <laughs> Call me JD, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, our children's schools are teaching them that they are victims based on race. Sure. Family values are being mocked, and our, con our, con our country is being constantly disrespected. How will a Trump Vance administration address CRT? DEI and SEL in the public schools and support parent advocates without fear of government reprisals? Yes, ma'am. Another big and important question, and I obviously don't know uh, the backgrounds of all of you um, entirely, at least. I don't know the, the backgrounds of a lot of folks in the room, but, you know, I'm 40 years old, and so I'm very much a child of the 90s. And my wife is uh, 38, though she's probably going to get pissed off uh, for, for <laughs> saying that publicly. Can't take it back now. But, um, you know, so, so her, her parents are legal immigrants from South India, okay? And she was born and raised in San Diego. But I think because we grew up in the 90s, and I'm not saying things were perfect, don't, don't mis mistake me, but we grew up in a, in a country where we were, thought, we were taught to think about people as people and not as whatever artificial, superficial skin color they had. And I think because both of us grew up with that attitude, you know, we met, we fell in love, we started a family, and we never thought anything of it, right? I mean, there, there was never, you know, the, the, the only funny and slightly awkward comment that anybody ever made um, is when, when, I, when my mom asked, you know, what ethnicity Usha was, and I said she was Indian, she said, which tribe? I said, well, <laughs> you know, slightly off, mom, slightly off. <laughs> but, like, she's, she, she, she actually, my mom made this point to me. And I think it's, you know, mom is, is so smart. She's just one of the smartest people I've ever met. 
And she said, you know, I get really mad at all these people talking about your biracial children and, you know, whether they're white or whether they're Indian or what their background is. She's like, they're just our babies, right? And, and I want us to think about all of our kids, whatever the color of their skin, they're just our babies. They're American babies. And that is what matters. And, and, and so I think one thing that we have to do is do better as leaders, talking about, yes, of course, we've got you know, differences, and yes, of course, there are things that happen in America's history that aren't perfect. I'm not saying we ignore that, but we, we, we talk about it as a way to getting to a point where we see each other as Americans first and foremost. That's the most important thing. That's what we have to get back to. And, I, I, and then we also have to be honest, and this goes back to one of the earlier questions, that a lot of this crap is not something that anybody, black, white, you know, Latino anything would teach their kids, they're learning it from very radical curriculums that are being planted in our schools by money coming from American taxpayers. And so I think the first thing that we have to do is defund CRT and all of the radical curricula that's going into our schools. That's really important. But, 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 but ma'am, the, the, I think the leadership part of this is really important too. For some reason, we got it into our heads that in a country as big and diverse and different as ours is, we needed to emphasize our differences. I actually think that what real leadership requires now is emphasizing our commonality as Americans. I think that we have a common destiny in this country, and if we forget that and we ignore it, it's going to rip our country apart. Let's not do that. Let's be Americans first. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can ask him for a final comment. Yeah. So we have, um, we, you have been, had a very busy day. <laughs> you need to get I've had a fun here. day. <laughs> it's been a, fun it's been a day. good day. Well, so we have thousands and thousands of moms watching this. Yes. And so we'd just like to know what would be your final comments to the moms who are watching? So I guess a couple of things. Uh, first, I'd ask you to get out there and get involved because we've got 20 days to go. And, you know, we're not going to win this election unless everybody gets out there and votes and makes their voice heard. I, I, you know, the media is never going to be honest. Uh, the Democrats are never going to be honest. But if you want to take your country back, if you want to teach your kids your own values, if you want to save your children from unsafe neighborhoods, if you don't want your kids taught racial hatred disguised as diversity, then we have to get out there and we have to elect Donald Trump. And there's a lot that we can do to make that happen just in 20 days. Do you have friends or family that you think would probably vote the right way, but they haven't gone to the polls yet? Maybe they have an absentee ballot they haven't mailed in yet. Maybe you just want to post on social media like, hey, I saw J.D. Vance, and he's not nearly as bad as the media says that he is, <laughs> right? There are all of these ways where you can, you can get involved. And think about the small number of ballots in 2020 that if changed... Donald Trump is the president of the United States. And a lot of the problems we've seen in the last three and a half years simply are not happening in this country. So ask yourself, wake up on November the 6th. You want to be able to say, I did everything. And I think that the question over the next 20 days is, what does that everything mean? I think it's talking to your friends, talking to your family. If you've got spare time, donate and, 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 and donate your time with the local party. Call people. Right? Knock on doors. There's so much that we can get, do to get involved to make sure that our people get out there and vote. I think the second thing is, you know, moms are, are in a very unique situation, okay? And, and what I mean is, look, I see the polls. The polls tell you, and I don't necessarily believe the polls, but, you know, let's say they're right. If the polls are right, right now, frankly, Donald Trump will win this election. And that's a good thing. It's a thing to be happy about. But the polls also tell you that we're doing better, President Trump and I are doing better with male voters, and the Democrats are doing a little bit better with female voters. Well, I think moms are the best ambassadors to say, look, don't believe the lies that you've heard about these guys. Vote for what's in your best interest. Vote for public safety. Vote for lower grocery prices for your family. Vote for you know, housing prices that are affordable for normal people to, to, to live in American homes. We have got to get back to common sense. And I think the best way to, to, to put common sense out there is person to person, the conversations you have at church, at the grocery store with your friends, because you guys all have, I guarantee every single person in this room has somebody in their friendship circle who's maybe a little skeptical of me or maybe a little skeptical of the president. Just talk to them and say, I think these guys, I've got 
good heads on their shoulders, they care about the country, and most importantly, they're gonna make our lives better. And I think if we do that, if we get out there and use that person-to-person -person power that we have just to communicate and persuade our friends and family, we're gonna win. We got 20 days, let's go and do it. God bless you all. There you go, thank you, Senator Vance. Thank you so much, we thank really you. appreciate you Bye. taking time out yeah. today. All right, there you have it. Uh, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance uh, in the battleground state of Pennsylvania uh, participating in this town hall hosted by the group Moms for Liberty. Uh, so many uh, there asking Vance crucial questions as we are just 20 days away from the general election there. Uh, we do want to just, before we go to a quick commercial break, focus briefly uh, on Pennsylvania. We spoke with Kaylee Schuyler in Pittsburgh earlier today. We have the 